Welcome to episode 12 of Michael Reads from a Book, a series in which I read from a series of books. Today's entry is Plutarch, The Fall of the Roman Republic. If I'm remembering my classics correctly, this is a bunch of biographies on people that lived around that time. It's a nice, interesting one. Funny name. Pompey. Good old Pompey. This is from chapter 4 of the book Pompey, 106 to 48 BC. The life of Pompey is a curious mixture. The opening remarks on Pompey's character are surprising, to say the least. The Pompey who emerges from the pages of Cicero is hardly tactful, easy of manner, and free from conceit. Yet Plutarch later makes several more pertinent observations. He recognizes Pompey's tendency to throw his weight around, as evidenced by his treatment of Lucullus and Metellus Creaticus, and is aware of the extreme sensitivity to criticism and his constant yearning for popular approval. He also fully appreciates certain aspects of Pompey's career. The extraordinary nature of Pompey's rise, the skill with which he developed his clientele in Sicily, Africa, and the East, and his brilliant capacity for organizing large-scale campaigns as he gets to pirates are all given with due notice. But as always, Plutarch is deterred by the complexities of internal politics. His remarks on Pompey's lack of political success on his return from the Mithridatic War, but the account of the decade before the Civil War, leaves much to be, to be desired. Plutarch obviously did not understand Pompey's attitude to Cicero's exile and recall, and he pays no attention at all to the relations between Pompey and the Boni, either before or after Luca, or to Pompey's infinitely devious efforts to play off Caesar against the Boni in the late 50s. On the credit side, he gives proper weight to the death of first Julia and then Crassus, and is excellent on Pompey's exploration of growing anarchy, and on the factor that secured him his third consulship. The narrative of the Civil War is lacking in any discussion of Pompey's controversial strategy, but by way of compensation, it contains one of the biographer's rare political insights, for Plutarch is conscious that the Boni were using Pompey and that, if Pompey once should got rid of Caesar for them, he would find himself put on the shelf, not liquidated. So I guess this is the start of the biography proper. From the very beginning, the Roman people seem to have felt for Pompey the same feelings as those expressed by the Prometheus of Aeschylus for Heracles when, after Heracles had delivered him, he says, I hate the father, but I love the son of his. For Romans never hated any of their generals so much and so bitterly as they hated Pompey's father Strabo. While he was alive, they stood in awe of his military power, and he was certainly a most formidable soldier. But when he was killed by a thunderbolt, they insulted his dead body and dragged it from the bier as it was being carried to the funeral. Fire? No. On the other hand, no Roman was ever held in such affection by the people as Pompey was. And no Roman enjoyed an affection which started so early in his career, which reached such a height in his prosperity, and which remained so constant in his time of adversity. There was one reason and one reason only for the hatred felt against Strabo, namely his insatiable love of money, but there were many reasons for loving Pompey. His modest way of life, his record as a soldier, his eloquence, his trustworthy character, and the easy, tactful way he had of dealing with people. No one ever asked favors with less offense or granted them with more grace, for among his many charms he possessed the ability to give without arrogance and to receive without loss of dignity. At the beginning of his career, too, he had an appearance which seemed to plead for him before he opened his mouth, and this was a great help to him in winning people's affections. He was attractive, certainly, but part of his attractiveness lay in a kind of dignity and sweetness of disposition. And at the height and flower of his youthful beauty, there was apparent at the same time the majesty and the kingliness of his nature. His hair swept back in a kind of wave from the forehead, and the configuration of his face round the eyes gave him a melting look so that he was supposed, though the resemblance was not a close one, to resemble the statues of King Alexander. It was a name often given to him in his early youth, and Pompey himself was not averse from it, so that people soon applied the word Alexander to him in mockery. It was because of this, too, that Lucius Philippus, a man of consular rank, who, in speaking for Pompey in the courts, said that there was nothing strange in the fact that he, being Philip, should love Alexander. I get it. They say that Flora, 
The courtesan, when she was getting on in years, was always delighted to tell people about her early intimacy with Pompey. She always had the marks of his bites on her, she said, when she went away after having made love with him. She would also describe of how one of Pompey's friends, called Geminius, fell in love with her. The advances he had made to her annoyed her, and she told him that she must refuse him because of Pompey. Geminus then approached Pompey, and Pompey turned her over to Geminus, but afterwards he would never have anything to do with her or even meet her, although it was thought that he was very much in love with her. And she herself, far from taking this as a courtesan might be expected to do, was ill for a long time with grief and longing for him. And yet she was so famous for her good looks that when Cassilus Metellus was decorating the temple of Castor and Pollux with statues and paintings, he had a portrait of her painted and dedicated it with other offerings because of her extreme of her remarkable beauty. Well, I guess that's a glimpse into Rome. I'll see you again in the next installment. Goodbye.